Welcome to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Juan, and we are very happy to have you back here with us. We're starting a brand new course today. Well, this is actually a course we've had for a few years now out in our website, but we're starting a new course here on the podcast. It's the Genesis Story. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a special course for me. This is actually the first one that I got to work on when I started at Online Courses. And people always ask us why we choose a particular course topic. And in this case, I think the decision was really easy for a couple important reasons. The first is, is there, is there anything more fundamental and important to understand than the book of Genesis? Uh, is there a book that's more interesting and has more depth to be able to peel away and understand? I, I, I don't think there is. And, and so this was an exciting course to work on. But also, the second reason has to do with the instructor, the teacher. And it's always a good sign when people walk up to you and tell you about a great class experience. And that happened all the time with Dr. Justin Jackson and his course on reading biblical narratives that he teaches every summer here. And so we wanted to be able to produce a course that reflects what he does here on campus every year and, and give you a little insight into what Dr. Jackson does. Yeah, I agree with you on, on the on the subject of the course. I took a course on Genesis and on, as an undergrad, and looking back on it, it's probably one of my favorite courses because there's just so much in Genesis. And sometimes we can get lost in debates that are really not central to the to the theme of the book. And I think Dr. Jackson, as people will see as they take this course, does a great job at bringing those themes out and really developing them. I agree. And, and one, I think, quick housekeeping note before we jump into this, uh, Dr. Jackson does use the Robert Alter translation of the book of Genesis. I think it's really helpful as part of his effort, as Juan mentioned, to try to draw out the literary qualities and, and some of the beauty of the book of Genesis. That's what Robert Alter's translation tries to do. So when you talk about the the inspired word of God and how you know complex and beautiful and, and how rich in meaning it is, that's what Robert Alter tries to do with that translation. I know it was the first time that I've been exposed to that translation, and it was very helpful and interesting for me to to dig into Genesis and see some of the differences it it had from from my typical translation. Yeah, I I guess, you know, from personal experience as a non-English native speaker, translations are are very important because sometimes you try to say things in in a language that just absolutely doesn't make sense when you translate it literally to a different language. And so that's why I I think looking at different translations, it really enriches your understanding of what somebody's trying to say because they might be using certain words that just don't make sense in a different language and have a, a poetic significance to them or, you know, you're trying to draw a comparison to a, the same word that you use it in a different way earlier. And, and Alter is really good at bringing that out in the English text. And, and it's very helpful to gaining a better understanding of the book. And today you're going to listen to lecture one of our course on the Genesis story, which is the introduction provided by the president of Hillsdale College, Dr. Larry P. Arn. You can also go to hillsdale.edu slash course to sign up for the Genesis story today. That is our full online course. It's available for free. If you do that, you can unlock the videos for this course. I really like these in particular because they're filled with the beautiful artwork inspired by the book of Genesis. You can also get helpful resources like our study guides connected to these lectures, and you can test your knowledge by taking our quizzes and a final quiz at the very end to earn a completion certificate. So you can go to hillsdale.edu slash course today and sign up for the Genesis story for free. And without further ado, here's Dr. Arn with lecture one of our course on the Genesis story. Hello, welcome to this Hillsdale College online course on the book of Genesis, a very great thing. Uh, my name is Larry Arn. I work here at the college. I'm going to introduce this course. I'm going to start by thanking you. Uh, we're very proud of these online courses. I think this is the 24th of them, and we're proud of that number of you who watch them and were proud of your reaction to them. And apart from uh, the nature of the students at Hillsdale College, it's one of the most hopeful things we know. So thank you very much. If ever we can be helpful to you, that's what we're here for. We've decided that we love to learn and we love to teach, and if somebody wants to join us, we invite them. Um, I'm also going to do three things by way of introduction to the course. I'm going to say uh, why and how we teach the book of Genesis at Hillsdale College. And I'm going to say a few things about the book of Genesis, which Professor Justin Jackson, a very great teacher, is going to speak about much more fully. 
And uh, I'm going to introduce Justin Jackson, one of my favorite people. So the reason why we do everything here comes from a mission that was written for the college by people I think were heroic people, many of them, friends of Abraham Lincoln, some of them, who served in the cause and helped to build the cause that he served and, and led. And uh, they wrote in 1844 an Articles of Association that's a beautiful document. It's the document I read that persuaded me to come here. And it establishes four things as the purposes of the college. They're pillars of the college, you might say. Uh, one of them is sound learning, and that means high learning. That means the study of ends, especially the ultimate ends toward which human life is organized. And it means the building of a moral character, that is to say, the human being in action, being brave and moderate and just and practically wise. Those are the cardinal virtues. And they're very much written into the history of this place and into this Articles of Association. And then uh, the third is the teaching of the Christian faith by precept and example. And the fourth is freedom. Uh, the right of the human being to be free, in part, uh, sort of at the peak, to exercise his mind to understand the things around him and pick his way. And, of course, all the other freedoms follow underneath that. And so we've always stood for those four things, for learning, for character, for faith, and for freedom. And uh, those things today, in the way we understand things, sort of jar against each other. Uh, for example, sound learning and higher learning they have to do with the intellect, the operation of the mind. What have they to do with moral action, with being brave? Uh, was Socrates brave? Did he need to be? So, so are they related? And our view of that is the human being is an integrity of body and soul. And so the excellence of the human being, the virtues of the human being, would involve both the body and the soul, and they come together. And then this other thing is even more trouble, troublesome and bigger, and it is raised by this course on Genesis, and that is, why would a, a place devoted to learning, to the exercise of the mind, to rational understanding, also be interested in faith? Aren't they contradictory? And uh, that I will address at a little bit of length, because that would be why we study Genesis here. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. And wisdom is an achievement of the intellect, of what you can know by thinking things through. So you wouldn't, in philosophy, you wouldn't build your premises on the basis of something in which you have faith. Uh, very much not the way you do it. You try to, in fact, in philosophy, uh, the way we teach it here, which is well, and also teach it in some other departments too, uh, politics where they teach a lot of political philosophy is an example. We kind of start with the things in front of us and try to understand how we know what they are. Same thing, one of the things in front of us is each other, ourselves. What are we? And so you start with questions. Socratic philosophy begins this way with, what are we? How should we live? What are these other things we see and how do we know what they are? How do we figure it out? And there's a great account of that in classical philosophy. And classical philosophy, of course, was born in a time before the Christian faith, in pagan times, 400 or so years before Christ. And their account runs like this. They say, well, you know, when you th start thinking about how you recognize things, you're asking the question, how do you use common nouns? Down there, there's a glass, which they put here for me in case I get raspy. And uh, I'll hold it up so you can see it. Right. And if you think about it, that's one glass. It's a kind. There are many kinds, many, many kinds. And somehow we always recognize them. And if this was the glass, then something that differed from it would not be a glass. And so it's kind of hard to say exactly what do we see. And the fact that we can use the common noun glass is the central op operation according to the classics of human reason. It's the thing we can do that the other creatures can't do. And if you think about that for a minute, it opens up a rich world for us. Because uh, the way I put the point, I've said it so many times that I'm, I'm fond of it and everybody else is tired of it. In my family, we raise children and boxer dogs. And uh, for the first two years, we raise them just alike. Uh, they live on the floor. They eat each other's food. They 
act badly in their own way. But then when the kids get to be about two, they start talking. And the dogs never do. And they've all heard all the same things. Why do the dogs not talk? Why do the children talk? Nobody teaches them to talk. They just hear. And they pick up something that other creatures don't. And yet when we realize that about ourselves and look inside ourselves, we see that whatever it is about us that makes us different, that thing too is imperfect. First of all, it's located in a perishable body. And second of all, we have this uh, thing that is about us, about the way we learn and the way we think. That's the reason why uh, students get dark circles under their eyes at finals time. We go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, and we have to piece them together while we go. We don't know everything at once. We can't really see anything except what we can see. Aristotle says there's uh, nothing in the soul that doesn't get there through the senses. So that's a kind of a limit. Well, once you see what those problems are, you can imagine a being that learns all at once. Also, a being that learns all the time or knows everything, doesn't learn, knows everything. Knows everything in an instant, sees everything in an instant. You see, we're on our way up through angels toward God. And that means that the implications of God are in the hierarchy of things, including us, and in the imperfection even of the highest things that we see. And that means that the humanities raise the question of God. And so you need to be thinking about that. Great books, great people, and great ideas. Knowledge of these things is critical to becoming a well-educated human being. That's why I'd like to tell you about an easy and enjoyable way for you to listen and learn whenever and wherever you want. And that's through the Hillsdale Dialogues. If you haven't heard about the Dialogues, once a week, Hillsdale College President Larry Arne joins radio veteran Hugh Hewitt to discuss topics of enduring relevance. From time to time, they also talk about current events, but always with an eye toward more fundamental truths. And they want you to listen in, to join a conversation like no other. The Hillsdale Dialogues are posted every Friday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. But then think about this. How are you going to know about God? Because if you imagine a perfect being, it would be omnipotent. That means it could do anything. And then on the other hand, to be omnipotent, it would need to be omniscient. It would need to know everything. And if it was the origin of things, it would be the creator. Now, I will tell you that in Greek philosophy, they don't imagine a creator because they stick with what they see and they see that the planets are always there and they always move in the patterns they move and baby dogs give, uh, uh, grown-up dogs give rise to baby dogs and acorns produce oak trees and so the implication is that it's gone on forever. But on the other hand, they did ask the question, you know, did all this start somewhere? And if so, where? And if there actually was a creator then he would actually have to be outside nature. He wouldn't be just that dense lump at the beginning of things. He'd have to be something outside that thing to be the source of it. And he would need to be an eternal thing, a thing that didn't start, in order to be perfect, I'm saying. And so then you start drawing a picture of God. And that picture is supported by the Traditions of learning that come to us, especially through Judaism and Christianity. In Christianity, Jesus is the Word. That's what God has to say, just like we say. Use words, and only we use them. And so there's an invitation in the faith to think and try to explain. Understanding that we're unlikely to be able to explain everything at once, including especially the thing of which we could have no sensory evidence, the creator of everything. And that's why in the tradition, uh, the study of God, theology, has always been part of the canon of the liberal arts and fits in the canon, understanding that, it's, that the faithful part of it, the revealed part of it, 
that that part is a different kind of knowing than the kind that we undertake when we observe and think and record and calculate and in the natural sciences experiment. And it doesn't mean that they're not both valuable, but they are different. And so to call yourself a wholly thoughtful people, as far as a human being could be, person, wholly thoughtful person, you'd have to do some thinking about God. And that's what we think here at Hillsdale College and always have thought. Now, I should mention an interesting feature of the college because I said these four things all act and react upon each other and they form an integrity. And here's the funny thing. Uh, just as the uh, Articles of Association say, the teaching of the Christian faith by precept and example shall remain a conspicuous aim of the college. It also says that we are grateful to God, to God, mind you, for the inestimable blessings of civil and religious freedom. That means everybody's got a right to worship as he pleases. And that is why, although this has been a seriously Christian college from its first day until today, it's also true that we've never quite required a faith statement to attend here. And that's for the same reason that we don't ask anybody, we don't demand that anybody accept conclusions here. You have to think them through for yourself and you owe everybody else the best arguments you can make about them. Why? Because we've all agreed about the grounds of our cooperation, which is a travel upwards. So that's why how you sort of arbitrate between these elements of our mission. But then the minute I say that word arbitrate, I take it back because they actually form an integrity, an attempt to understand how and to be excellent human beings, creatures of God given with a knowing mind. And the students all commit to themselves to undertake to know those things, to learn those things, to make them their own. So Genesis comes up a tremendous amount. It's also in the majors. Several majors have extensive time devoted to this one book of the Bible. And uh, maybe Shakespeare and Plato and Aristotle get that much attention among things in the humanities. But I can't think of anything else. So it's important here. And then the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible, profound, serious, and mysterious. And I'll mention a few things about it that make it so. First of all, the first line is, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think I quote that accurately. Who's speaking? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because it would need to be God. He would be the only one there. But on the other hand, later, all through Genesis, uh, God is often quoted, introduced by, and then God said. So here, the first thing is left a little unclear. Where does it come from? Isn't that interesting? And you can see right now, already, this is an account of the origins of things, which is, as I have argued, in both the natural sciences and in the humanities, a natural question presented to the human being when he begins to learn. And this begins with, God did it, and we don't know who tells us. The first 11 chapters, there are 50 chapters in Genesis, and the first 11 chapters are like each other, and the last 39 are like each other. The first 11 are mysterious and general. You know, there's the creation, there's the garden, there's the expulsion from the garden, there's uh, Noah and the flood, uh, there's the growth of humanity, there's the Tower of Babel and the deprivation of language, and it ends there. And then on chapter 12, right at the beginning, begins a particular story, and it's about particular named people who live in particular places and who are given particular responsibilities by God. Chapter 12 of Genesis begins with uh, God said to Abraham, and I'm paraphrasing now, paraphrasing now. Justin loves, by the way, the translation of Genesis by Robert Alter, 
and I commend it to you. It's a very serious and lovely piece of work, both. And that altar, I, mean, I don't know him, but he must be a deeply learned man. If you read the preface and introduction to that book, you'll see what I mean. And uh, in rough language, God says, uh, get yourself up and go to another place where you've never been. Take your family, leave your place. This is a farming time. You leave your land. And uh, I'll make you a great people. And then this language. And this will be a blessing to all of the people on the face of the earth. That means in Genesis, with chapter 12, it's not just a uh, story of the creation of everything, including us, our ancestors. It's also a story meant for the benefit of all of us. This will be a blessing to all the peoples on the earth. It's about uh, the rest of Genesis, the 39 chapters are about the choosing of the Jewish people, which turns out to be a very hard duty. Abraham's got to go. He's got to almost sacrifice his son. You know, the son and other offspring are exactly what's been promised to Abraham. There's a meaning in that story, and it takes pondering to figure out what it is, because, of course, it's confusing, too, because you're not supposed to be sacrificing your children. This is not a god like some of the pagan gods who demands child sacrifice for propitiation. And then on it goes from there. You know, soon enough you get Jacob born, and he gets renamed Israel, and he has 12 sons. And these 12 sons become the heads of the 12 tribes. And one of them, Joseph, is the favored, and he gets sold into slavery. And all that's part of a great drama that ends with the, because, you know, Genesis ends with the point that Jacob, Israel, has died and gone back home to uh, be buried. And then they all return, and they're all still living in Egypt. And Joseph, the one who founded their position in Egypt, Joseph speculates that we're going to get to go back home one of these days. But that's going to be hard. And so we need Moses. And of course, Moses is the great figure in the wonderful book of Exodus. And Genesis sets the stage for him. So I hope you enjoy that. I'll tell you about Justin. Justin's one of the best teachers I've ever met, one of the best teachers here, and that's saying something. Uh, he has a great thing about him, and that is uh, he's one of the hardest graders in the college and one of the most popular teachers in the college. And if you think about that for a minute, that would be a reason for us to be proud of our college because that's not uncommon here. He's a lit professor. He knows medieval stuff. He went to Purdue, got his PhD there. He's a uh, tremendous teacher of writing. He knows how to do that. They have a famous writing center at Purdue, and he was a graduate of it. He made a deal with us that uh, when we hired him, he wanted to teach Middle English and Dostoevsky and Genesis, and he didn't want to run a writing center. And so what we did, we snookered him. We uh, organized a way for him to organize the writing center but not have to spend a lot of time on it. And it's great the way he did it. I guess I'd say the only complaint that I have about Justin is that I cannot get him to trim his beard. Apart from that, he's awesome. And I envy you the privilege of meeting him for the first time. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hillsdale Online Courses podcast. If you want to continue learning about the book of Genesis or other topics, please visit hillsdale.edu slash course. There you can find over 40 free online courses, including American Citizenship and Its Decline with Victor Davis Hanson, C.S. Lewis on Christianity, Ancient Christianity, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and many more. The courses include additional readings, study guides, fully produced videos, and you can chat with your fellow students on a dedicated forum. Upon completing a course, you will also get a certificate. All our courses are free because we believe that a virtuous citizen is the best defense for liberty. So pursue the education necessary for freedom and happiness at hillsdale.edu slash course today. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Thanks for listening.